Can I get a show of hands from the audience? Who of you have at some point woken up to a dream or nightmare where you were back in school? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank goodness I'm not the only one. This is pretty much everything I had to learn in high school. So I'd like to ask you all a question. How much of what you had to learn in high school do you think you actually remember? 10%? 20%? Well, maybe you can make it simpler. How many of you that are in the audience today and aren't currently in the field of physics still remember how to calculate a spring constant? Yeah. <laughs> That's very few hands. How many still remember when Cook set foot on Australia or when Napoleon died? Isn't it strange when you think about all these things that you spend so much time learning all this stuff and yet you remember so very little? Maybe you thought it was you. Maybe you just weren't as smart as the others. The truth is, you could have learned a lot more, but you didn't. And more importantly, that isn't your fault. You see, whether it's your high school curriculum or the yearly courses you take for your job, the reason why you don't remember so much of them is because the way we deal with learning is often fundamentally wrong. Now, I wasn't too popular in school, and it was mostly because I kept using one word which none of my teachers seemed to like. Why? I would ask, why do I have to keep repeating the same material over and over again? Why am I only getting an 8 as a grade while all my tests were 10 out of 10? This just isn't fair. And no matter how often I kept asking these types of questions, the answer I got always seemed to be more, th more of the same. And it was something along the lines of, well, that's just the way we do things. So. By the time I was 12 years old, I'd kind of given up on <laughs> traditional education and found something that I really enjoyed in the world of online game development. You see, I got a team of some 15 people together, and we started tearing apart these popular games and turning them into new ones. So instead of making homework, I spent my time for years recreating all the tanks and planes of World War II in 3D, recording sound effects, composing music, even writing AI. And when we were done, we would give these creations away for free. You might say my hobby got kind of out of hand, because by the time I finished high school, some three million people had played something that I worked on. Now, I had many more adventures in gaming afterwards. And it was the skills that I picked up there, not in school, that eventually inspired me to start a company that built interactive training games. It was my way to create a form of learning that I would have wanted to be a part of. And funny enough, life turns out to have this crazy sense of humor. Because as we started rolling out this training software to customers all over the world, we got similar responses everywhere. Managers, experts, they were baffled at the results of their people. They were performing way below what was expected. And we started looking into this and found out that of the basic knowledge that these people needed to do their job, they only had roughly 40%. It didn't matter whether they were in sales or security. The reason why they were failing at our training was because they didn't know what they were supposed to be doing in the first place. So there I was, back at square one. I'd basically figured out that the system that didn't seem to work for me wasn't working for anyone else either. So I decided to dive into learning. And what I found is that it made even less sense to me than it did when I was a kid. You see, ever since we shifted away from master and apprentice style learning, and we went to group education in schools, we've sort of been optimizing learning to be this mass production process. And in doing so, we completely lost track of the basic principles that make learning work on an individual level. You see, whether or not a learning experience works for you is roughly determined by four principles. And by now, we like to call these principles the pillars of learning. And the reason why so many learning solutions today are getting such terrible results is because they neglect most, if not all, of these pillars. 
Let me show you. The first pillar of learning is attention. You see, when I want to teach you something, I have to keep in mind that you have a limited attention span to absorb all that knowledge. That's your focused attention span, and much like this talk, it lasts for about 20 minutes. But in the real world, we're so used to putting people in classrooms all day and setting them behind hours of e-learning material that we've totally forgotten what the impact is once you start neglecting someone's attention span. There was a great study conducted in this, where a group of researchers came up with a completely fictional country and made a whole bunch of lecture material around it. They then took two groups of students and taught them this material. The first group, they gave a lecture of one hour, while the second group, they gave three lectures of 20 minutes with ample time in between, just to see what would happen if they figured out, OK, we can stick with these 20 minutes. And the results were crazy. A week later, they tested the knowledge of these students. And the first group that had the material in an hour, they had 18% knowledge left. While the group that got the material in blocks of 20 minutes, with ample time in between, they were at 85% of the knowledge. More than three times the learning results, simply by dosing your knowledge properly. Crazy. But of course, attention isn't the only thing that determines how much of the knowledge that someone's broadcasting, you can actually absorb. Because the second pillar is capability. You see, if you're much better at learning something, then you can deal with much more complicated information, much more challenging information. And this is something we understand really well in the video games industry. Because what we're doing there is automatically feeding you this perfect balance between what you're capable of and what kind of challenge we give you. And through that, what you're doing in a game doesn't feel like learning, it just feels like taking on one interesting challenge after the next and getting better and better. But again, if you look back at the real world, that's not how we do things. We have a whole classroom full of totally different people, and we're sending them all the same message. We're giving them all the same material, the same with e-learning. Basically, huge amounts of people are getting the exact same amount of knowledge in the same density, in the same order, sent out to them, well, they're all different. So what happens, basically, if you designed and taught your material perfectly, average Joe ends up being in the flow. But everyone else falls short. Either you are a little bit less capable than average Joe, which means you end up in frustration. And the material is eventually rushing by so quickly, you can't even follow. Or you might be more capable. Maybe if you reach your potential, you could do a lot for society. But unfortunately, you end up bored. You're basically falling asleep, only to wake up, hear something that sounds vaguely similar, and go, like, oh god, I can go to sleep again. This is, of course, terrible. Now, these two pillars, these first two pillars, they deal with just absorbing information. Uh, but even if you imagine that we would get all of these perfect, and we got you to somehow, through some incredible learning system, absorb 100%, we wouldn't be there yet. Because if next month you don't remember any of that, we've basically just wasted your time. So that's what takes us to the third pillar of learning, which is retention. Retention, or remembering something for the long term, has everything to do with repeating it. And there's a simple law about this, which is the more often you repeat something, the longer you'll remember. But there's a second part to this law that most people don't fully understand. And that is that after every repetition, it takes longer for the next repetition to be effective. So what happens? Well, basically, it's very simple. This is all to do with something we call the forgetting curve. And although it's different for different topics and different people, the basic principle is simple. If I want to teach you something today, let's say five new things, I could repeat all those five things five times right now. And in a week from now, you wouldn't remember any of it, except that it was really, really annoying. But if I tell you these things today, and I'll tell you again in a couple of days, then a couple of weeks, then a couple of months, and then six months, you will probably remember it for up to a year afterwards. Now, to see how badly we deal with that in the real world, just look at, say, high school math. Now, you may not remember much about high school math, which I already told you isn't really your fault, but you'll definitely remember how it's taught. Usually, you get about two books per year. Every book has about five chapters, 10 chapters in all. 
And every month you get a chapter followed by a test. Every chapter is about a different topic. And those topics return each year. So if you got algebra in month one of year one, you can bet that in month one of year two, you'll have advanced algebra, and so on and so forth. And if you look at this from a distance, it seems sensible. Students get the same amount of material every month, and teachers get to spend one month a year dealing with one topic for all the years they're teaching. But when you start looking at the way memory works, this all stops making sense really quickly. Because if we have an average person repeat algebra for about a month, it takes about three months afterwards before they seriously start to forget things. And after a year, almost everything is gone. So while teachers think they're adding the same portion of knowledge every month, in fact, you're not just learning this new knowledge, you're also forced to reconstruct everything you've forgotten from last year, and so on and so forth. Which leads us to this crazy situation where there's this teacher going, ha, ah, what's wrong with Peter? He's probably not trying, because he did great in year one, but now it's year four and he's struggling, and we're still giving him the same amount of material every month. You know, it must be his fault. Of course, that's totally not true, because Peter got a lot better at math in those four years, just not quite good enough to relearn three months' worth of material, plus all this new stuff on top. So we're dealing with <laughs> remembering stuff pretty badly, too. Now, that leaves us just one pillar. The last pillar is motivation, which is really quite simple. I mean, motivation gets us started with learning and keeps us going along the way. Without it, we are nowhere. And to see how badly we deal with motivation, all you have to do is send your kid to primary school, say, third grade, where they will get math for the first time. And at the end of the year, they'll come home and show you their report card, and it says an 8 out of 10. Oh, good job, Johnny. Here's some money from Grandma so you can buy something nice. Keep it up. So fast forward another year, end of year four. He comes back with his report chart, less happy this time, 6 out of 10. We get worried. He might fail next year. No money from Grandma. You have to try harder. Now, what are we teaching Johnny here? Well, it's really quite simple because, you know, no matter how bad he might be at math at this point, there's one thing he really realizes very well, and that is that a 6 is significantly less than an 8. So what we've taught him is that by going through another grueling year of math, he actually got worse at math. Now, we did this in video games, usually by accident, taking people's score away or levels away or, you know, anything they earned. And you know what turns out to happen? People stop playing. So a couple of companies went bankrupt, and generally speaking, we don't do that anymore. But of course, in the real world, education is mandatory, which is why we can get away with the world's worst design. Now, if this were a video game, Johnny wouldn't have gotten a 6. He would have gotten to level 14. And we'd have told him, you know, 6 plus 8, 14. He got better. And we'd have told him, if you get to level 16 at the end of the holiday period, we're going to give you a gold star. Now, that's motivating. So after seeing the sort of sorry state the pillars of learning were in for so many of our learning solutions, I decided to go back to the basics. So I sat down with our team, and we started building a solution, Noingo. And in itself, Noingo is a deceptively simple tool. You see, it's a game. It's a game that challenges you to learn on a daily basis by playing some trivia quizzes. Because science shows us that by learning through trivia quizzes rather than pure hard theory, you can learn up to five times more effectively. So we have you play these trivia quizzes, answering a bunch of questions as quickly as you can. And we thought it'd be nice to have some friendly competition, so we added the option to challenge a colleague or classmate. We're trying to beat them to the punch and give better answers faster than they do. If you get a question wrong, we immediately show you what the right answer is, so you learn quickly. And these quizzes take 30 to 40 seconds to play, so that means it's a perfect replacement for your daily Clash of Clans or Candy Crush fix. At the end of a quiz, we add your points up together, 
it increases your level, and if you did really well, you might get a gold star because you finished one of your daily quests. Now, I started out by saying that this game was deceptively simple, and I did it very intentionally, because if you look at this from the user's perspective, there's a lot of random stuff going on. I get a bunch of random questions, I get a random opponent, even random daily quests to keep me going. But what makes Nowingo so special is that there is nothing random about it. You see, we constructed this huge computational cluster in the cloud that is keeping an individual learning profile for every single user. So when you play Nowingo, it's really quickly learning exactly what your capability level is and feeding you those questions you need to stay in the flow. And with every answer you get right and wrong, it's learning your personal forgetting curve for every single topic you learn until it gets to the point that it can predict up to the day for every single fact you know that's in the system when you will forget it and repeat it just in time before you do, essentially giving you the closest thing to a superpower memory. But that's not all. It's also measuring your motivation and making sure it feeds you just the right opponents and the right daily challenges to keep you going. And at the same time, it keeps track of your attention span. So if it ever wanes, it gives you an easy out and tells you, oh, well, I'm all out of questions for today. Come back tomorrow. So it optimizes your learning session. So through this, for the first time in history, through the power of cloud computing and the technology of video games, we managed to create a solution that can deal with learning and knowledge on an individual level, an intelligence system capable of supplying a virtually limitless number of people with perfectly personalized learning experiences. Now, this system has only been available to the public for a handful of months, but the results we've got into it have given us an incredibly interesting insight in the gaps of knowledge that are all around us. We rolled this system out for security guards and found out that 36% of security guards would leave their colleagues in potentially life-threatening situations because they did know the rules about protecting their own safety, but were no longer aware of the rules about when to stick with their colleagues, despite their own safety being at risk. Now, as you can imagine, we're working hard to fill this knowledge gap before it has some dramatic consequences. But that's not all. We worked with a big Fortune 500 company, and they found out that their sales consultants knew less than 50% of their product portfolio and were unable to properly advise customers on all the rest. So we rolled out a pilot to a region, and after the problem was solved, not only did they have happier customers, but within six months, revenues for that region went up by over 50%. Even the traditional education institutions, usually the last to go, have started moving after we did a pilot at a secondary school with a class that had been struggling with math for over two years. Teachers had all but given up on getting these students to semi-decent grades. We put the game out there and had them play it with math questions for two weeks. After those two weeks, the amount of mistakes on math tests had gone down by more than 60%. So, of course, it's incredible seeing all these wonderful results, but the main thing that it shows us is how much work there is still to be done. Everywhere we look around us, there's huge gaps in people's knowledge, and the only reason they are there is because we're using bad solutions and dealing with learning in the wrong way. So, this is what I want to leave you with today. We owe it to our kids, our professionals, our customers, even our economy, to stop dealing with learning using century-old methods that have been proven wrong decades ago. We need to embrace the four pillars of learning and deal with knowledge in a whole new way. That way, we can stop teaching people years' worth of material they will never remember. We can teach them only those things that they really need to know and make sure they remember them for as long as they want to. <laughs>